My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first event in our fall public program series. So welcome. Tonight's topic is redefining traditional style for today's modern world. Uh, the lecture came about from a new collaboration with Traditional Home Magazine in celebration of the New York School of Interior Design's 100th anniversary this year. They approached us wanting to help celebrate our centennial and to also work along with our students. We jumped at the chance and are thrilled to be collaborating with the magazine's team and the prestigious companies here tonight. Brizo, Ethan Allen, Hinkley Lighting, Moda Hedda, and Sombrella. Thanks to Jill Esterman uh, and Stacy Farrar Hermes for all the work to make this a reality. Uh, the lecture can be considered a teaser as well. Uh, because in March 2017, we will have an exhibition on the theme Redefining Traditional Style in the New York School of Interior Designs Gallery Space on 69th Street. Uh, it's also a collaboration with Traditional Home, and our students will create designs for challenges <coughs> set forth in their classes for each of the five companies, using the company's existing products and their designs in new and creative ways, or creating new products with a modern twist. Uh, we can't wait to see the results and hope that you will all come back to, to the uh, opening and to see the exhibition. Tonight, we are fortunate to have the publisher of Traditional Home with us, Beth McDonough. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Beth in a moment, but I want to tell you uh, a little a bit about her. Beth assumed the role of publisher in April of 2015, overseeing all marketing and advertising for the brand. Uh, which maintains a circulation of more than 800,000 and a readership of nearly 5 million. Prior to taking the helm at Traditional Home, Beth served as group associate publisher of marketing for Traditional Home, Midwest Living, and Meredith Home Solutions. With experience in a variety of publishing and marketing roles throughout her career, she has also worked at Mademoiselle, Elle Magazine, and Family Circle. That being said, Beth, the podium is all yours, and enjoy the evening. Thank you, David, and thank you to everyone here this evening for joining us. We're very excited to kick this off, and it's really an honor for us to welcome our esteemed panelists this evening. So just as David introduced me, I have the honor of introducing um, each of the five panelists, as well as our moderator this evening. And as I introduce you, if you could please take the stage. First, I'd like to introduce Rick Wiedemeyer, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Hinkley Lighting. He began his career in 1969 after graduating from Ohio University which about, with a bachelor's degree in business. Starting in the factory and working his way through each manufacturing department and through all office processes, Rick developed a deep passion for sales, marketing, and product development. He now spends most of his time in global sourcing and product development. Throughout his career, Rick has traveled extensively and has made a point to visit the vast majority of Hinkley's customers in their home locations. He is committed to building meaningful relationships with customers and also in the Cleveland community. Rick, welcome. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Laura Brooks, who is the Senior Brand Manager for Brizo. As an integral member of the marketing team, Laura manages everything from photography to creative development to media placement, ensuring that Brizo continues its unique positioning in the marketplace. Prior to joining the Brizo team, Laura held several brand management positions with industry leading organizations, including The Limited, Stanley Steamer, and Scott's Miracle Grow. Thank you for being here tonight, Laura. Next, I'd like to introduce Wendy Cavalheim, who is the owner and president of Mata Hedda, one of the nation's foremost designers and manufacturers of fine dinnerware, tabletop accessories, and giftware. Leading Mata Hedda for over 20 years as CEO and design director, Wendy continues to build on the company's tradition of producing fine museum reproductions. 
The company holds or has held numerous historic licensing agreements, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the U.S. <coughs> National Trust, Mount Vernon, and the National Geographic Society. In addition, she's collaborated with other past associations, such as the U.S. State Department, the White House Historical Society, and the U.S. Presidential Libraries. Her book, From Drawing Board to Dinner Table, chronicles the history of Mildred and Rafi Madaheta's business and their love of collecting. Wendy expands this view to include information about how products are made and what to look for in fine ceramics. Welcome to Wendy. Thank you for joining us. Next, I'd like to introduce Jimmy DeBardino, who is the Vice President of Style for Ethan Allen. Jimmy has been with Ethan Allen for 29 years in a variety of roles. He started in the design centers in Ohio and has slowly migrated east, now stationed with the company in their headquarters in Danbury, Connecticut. He's responsible for the brand image at retail and throughout the extensive product assortment available both in store as well as online. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Jimmy. And last but certainly not least, Sherry Dongia is an award-winning designer and creative director who conceptualizes and develops products with a vision for the 21st century. She, excuse me, she serves as a brand ambassador for Sumbrella and is highly accomplished in home furnishings, textiles, apparel, and accessories. She has earned an international reputation built on her expertise in design and marketing. Sherry currently serves as a design consultant for Glen Raven, the, co the maker of Sumbrella Fabrics. Sherry, please join us on stage. Thank you. So guiding our conversation this evening will be Tori Malott, who is Traditional Homes Senior Style and Market Editor um, and a great uh, collaborator for us. So Tori, thank you, and we look forward to a, a great conversation. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for being here this evening. We have such an all-star panel, and we have a lot to get through and a lot of panelists, so I'm going to dive right in. Redefining traditional. I'm going to ask you, to begin with, I'm going to ask you guys to each answer a few questions, and then I am going to specifically point out some questions to, to you guys. So the first thing I want to talk about is tell me what traditional means to your company. Wendy, you want to start? Well, we are definitely traditional. <laughs> um, uh, I have my little notes here because there were things I knew I wanted to say and I'm sure I would forget. Um, tradition, all cultures have traditions. And traditions are repetitive <coughs> acts that instill meaning uh, for people and they bind people together. So. Um, it's really not a, dico a dichotomy, really, uh, tradition versus uh, contemporary. I uh, hope that's not me. I think it is. <laughs> uh, so, but, but traditions can become solidified and lose their meaning through repetition, where people, they originally had meaning, but it goes away over time. So um, it's important that we look at, uh, I keep saying religion, we keep <laughs> looking at tradition um, as something that uh, is a good thing, and then at the same time, we're not confined by it. We get meaning from it, and we use what we see in developing new avenues of expression. Great. And Rick, can you talk a little bit about what traditional means for your company? Sure. Um, we, <coughs> excuse me, we are a 95-year-old company that started as a manufacturer of traditional outdoor lanterns. And so that tradition is deep with us in everything that we do. As time has evolved, we've never lost that tie of the heritage of tradition and 
and today it's uh, basically in uh, using new materials or, or excuse me traditional materials in new ways new finishes new elements and, and uh, interpreting the same old tradition traditions that got us here okay and Laura sure for us as we think about tra traditional design I feel like I'm not going now um, we as a brand we really think about fashion clothing and then how that translates into your space and the spaces that you live in. And one of the things that that we notice is how personal both of those things are, from the way you dress yourself to the way you decorate your home. And as a younger <coughs> brand, we don't have quite the same sort of tradition that Ethan Allen would have, but, Thank you. <laughs> um, but we, we really try and make sure that the products that we're bringing to market, we're spanning that, that that entire continuum from more traditional styling or things that harken to the past all the way through more contemporary and forward-looking <laughs> designs because individuals find themselves anywhere on that spectrum. And it's important to give them the tools to really create an entire space that they feel comfortable in. And as we look at traditional, I, I think um, that typically means home for a lot of people. It's very subjective what that is, you know, whether that's a more stately end of the spectrum or something more industrial inspired, but we try and make sure we have those elements that help people achieve that. It is interesting that it's only home because none of us are wearing hoop skirts, which would be traditional, <laughs> <laughs> very traditional garb. <laughs> Jimmy, can oh, you I talk should. to that? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's a, that's a great question for me because I am a traditionalist. Uh, modern traditionalists. Um, I work for Ethan Allen. Um, have all of you heard of Ethan Allen? You guys know who we are. Uh, our roots are traditional, but it's not what you think it is. Uh, traditional is a way of life. It's the way people live. It's the way people dress. It's the way people think. Uh, traditional is is safe. It's familiar. People gravitate to what they're familiar with. It's like a jean jacket. Um, you know, it's like a favorite pair of jeans. It's like a black leather jacket. Um, at Ethan Allen, we want people to come in, <laughs> express their traditional values, but at the same time, we want to show them something new. So tradition is great because it's the best of old and it's the best of new. So it's combining those two and getting that really cool juxtaposition, and then you have something wonderful. So uh, traditional is what we do every day, but we take it a completely different way. Um, and before I leave here, every single one of you is going to have an Ethan Allen house. So. <laughs> <laughs> are you giving it away for free? Uh, 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 those are the people back there you got to talk to. But our, our tagline is, is classic design with a modern perspective. And everything that we do uh, design-wise and product-wise is, is, is classics, traditional, but definitely with a new perspective. So. Okay. And Sherry? I think I'll take the traditional word as a literal translation. And so... The Sombrero brand uh, was started in 1961 and was started by the Gantt family and it remains a privately held um, business. And so people are the most important element and tradition of treating their people really, really well and being really kind and uh, concerned about the environment. For 30 years, Sombrero has been a green company, which is kind of unbelievable, not just when it became trendy a decade or so ago. So every piece of uh, yarn, uh, fabric, and packaging material is recycled or biodegradable and does never, it never ends, in, ends up in the landfill. So um, these are kind of um, important traditions. Um, the other thing that I have personal experience with, uh, on the other end, I was a customer of Sombrella when I was at Dongia for 22 years as the design director, and they were the most incredible partner in our textile division to grow a business that was very, very, um, very new in the marketplace, and that was luxury fabrics that were solution dyed acrylic and um, performance. Uh, fabrics that people could use and not worry about and um, that was something that was a big commitment and they they are partners that really know how to make a business grow and they teach you along the way um, so many things about their product that you can then pass on with enthusiasm to your own customers so all of these um, traditions are what makes the company so strong today, 50-some years later. You know, I think it's so interesting. We all sort of defined 
um, traditional in a different way. Some of us talked about uh, traditional um, habits and traditional traditions within a company. And I think that's really important when discussing redefining traditional because traditions mean so many different things. It can be an aesthetic or it can be, you know, as Wendy pointed out, a habit, something that we do all the time. So I think right now the next question, let's focus on um, traditional designs aesthetically. So how are traditional designs relevant to modern day life and why do they continue to be so popular with consumers? And you can even speak to you know, your, the brands that you represent here. So Sherry, sure, let's take it away. Okay. <laughs> um, I think traditional iconic kind of uh, designs, whether it's a, it's a great slipper chair by Billy Baldwin or an incredible knoll table or a beautiful uh, brocade textile. These things are, they, ha they have lasting power and I think people today understand that to have an interior that really has soul and speaks to you, you need to mix these like very understandable pieces with very personal things, whether they're uh, family heirlooms or something you know from um, a retail <coughs> store or something from an auction or a flea market. So, I, I think that is, that's the key. And when you do bring something back that's from your archives in the fabric world, you cannot ever bring it back exactly as it was. You need to look at it and figure out how it's going to fit in today's life. And you either have to recolor it, change the scale, uh, put it on another ground, something with a lot of texture. Make it really 21st century. Don't just think it's going to be great because it was great 30 years ago. I'm curious in the fabric world, what would happen if you took a fabric and just resurrected it exactly the way it was? Would it be a flop, typically? I think it, it's very rare to find something that's just perfect the way it is. Something really should be updated. The color combinations, the scale sometimes is a really fun thing to play with, make it really giant. <laughs> so that when you put it on a chair, there's no repeat and each chair is different you know, do something like really daring and fun. Yeah, I know. Exciting. I'm really glad they're not bringing that bra brown shag carpet in its... But <laughs> don't say that life. because brown is very important. No, I, color color color. I think the one I'm remembering in my mind, I, mean, I hope they tweak it a little bit. It'll come back. <laughs> Jimmy, can you speak to that? Um, I, I think traditional is never going to go out of style. People gravitate to what they know. What they know. What's really cool, what's really important, our company, uh, we, we have these, these extensive meetings and we look at iconic pieces and we look at classics. And, and classics are, are designs that have withstood the test of time. Uh, people relate to them, they're, they're wonderful designs, but what the trick is, uh, we call it the new traditional, and is taking a classic or, t or taking something that, is, that has withstood the test of time and making it new and making it relevant. Our CEO has, a, has a, a question that he asks us constantly, is it relevant for the way people live today? So anything that we design, we, we love uh, taking from the past, but we're always looking forward to the future. So to me, those are two great worlds. That, you know, know where, you, where, where you've been and know where you're going to and kind of strive there. Um, customers come in and we have, all different, we have one of the largest demographics. We have, we have 20 year olds that come in and we have 70 year olds that come in and everybody has a different interpretation of how they want to live but everybody kind of gravitates toward the classics so it's kind of our job to say okay here are the classics but we've reinterpreted. Uh, Reimagined is a word that we use continuously. Uh, relevant is a word so let's take something that's tried and true and let's take it to the next level to the way people live today and we are very very conscious as designers and as a company that specializes in home interiors of how people live. Uh, and so we, we never stop. So we're always taking traditional design and we're always taking it to the next level. And if, if, if you do go into an Ethan Allen uh, Design Center, you're going to be pleasantly surprised because it's really the perfect balance of what's, what's old and what's new. So. Wait, Jimmy, I have a question. Now, you said that you have 70-year-olds and 20-year-olds. Yes. Would you say, typically, that the 70-year-olds come in and want sort of very traditional or are they willing to like mix it up too because I'm sure the 20 year olds you know it's kind of the 
um, it's sort of the moment of mixing and matching and high and low and things you've acquired from your grandparents. But I'm really curious about the, the older customer. Um, it, it's amazing. It's not, it's not who you think they are. Um, we, you know, we, do, we do have the typical very, very conservative, very kind of predictable customer. But the customer, it, it's, it's, it's amazing because older customers are scaling down. And they're giving away their, their furniture to their, to their children. And they're moving to metropolitan areas. And they're thinking differently. And they're a lot younger at heart. Uh, so just because they're older doesn't mean that they are, they, they are more stodgy. Um, so actually, some of the hippest jobs we've done have been for older people. And some of the most serious jobs we've done have been for younger people who really want to say, oh, I, I want to be traditional. This will never go out of style. OK, so we get that. But we're, it's our job as designers to say, yeah, you can have the best of both worlds, whether it be a young couple or whether it be an older couple scaling down and moving to a metropolitan area. So, so they're all fun. They're all different. Every customer we have is different. So it's, it's hard to pigeonhole each of the customers. But they're all looking for something. They're all looking for inspiration. And it's our job as designers and our job um, as, as one of the largest, I think, interior design firms in the world, in the world um, to, to inspire <laughs> these people and say, you can have traditional, you can have classic, but we're going to show you how to do it differently and make it more, more modern. We are going to end up with full rooms that we can now in by the end of this. <laughs> Let me tell you. Every one of you. <clears throat> now, Laura, you have a really interesting perspective. We were speaking earlier very briefly, and Brizo is a relatively new company. So, and, and you guys, I know you from as very modern, and you did that amazing collection with Jason Wu. So, how do traditional designs, how do they resonate with your customer? So I actually love this question because we've been <coughs> debating this in the office. What does traditional mean? Um, what does modern mean? All, all of this, because they're, they're words we throw around a lot, but they have such different meanings. And we asked a, a variety of designers, we just threw it out to them, what does traditional mean to you? And what we discovered was it's so individualistic. We had one designer based out in Hollywood. And everything we got, he was like, oh, it's chinoiserie. It's Hollywood Regency. It's you know, this, that, and the other. And then we had another designer. And she was bringing up Lucite and things from the 80s. And that was traditional to her. And then we started talking about it. And we said, but then what's modern? And people started talking Bauhaus. And they started talking Eames. And they were talking. Um, about the Barcelona chair, which were designed in the 20s and 30s, but are still viewed as modern. So we actually have a lot of debate about what these words really mean and, and how that starts to translate into design and, and for us into decorative plumbing design. And where we're sort of netting out is that traditional feels like home, whatever that is for you. And, and it's very regional, it's very personal. Uh, I think there are certain characteristics you can think of a stately design tends to fall into that traditional, sometimes more industrial elements. Um, the rustic farmhouse movement, you see a lot of those reinterpretations <laughs> or, or even restoring older pieces. But when we see it in room design, it's being mixed. It's being, as you said, reinterpreted in a different way. We introduced a stately collection last year, but we did it in a matte black finish. So just kind of a different way, we paired that with some stainless steel accents on it. And so it was a bit more of a modern edge to what would be a classic, you know, more Edwardian style masculine design. And, and I do, I, I see it being this mix and match and all of these different things coming together to create a space that feels comfortable and that, you know, really puts you at ease when you walk in. I have to say that is one of the best descriptions I've ever heard. In fact, I think we can all just leave right now. No, <laughs> no but traditional feels like home. And that is really, I think, at the crux of redefining traditional. It's not necessarily a Queen Anne chair. It's, it feels like home, which is so fascinating. Now, Rick, you have another interesting perspective because you are a traditional, you know, you started in traditional designs. So now, do you find that some of your customers are asking for more contemporary pieces, sort more streamlined? Like, how do you guys, how are you reinterpreting traditional? I wanted to um, uh, answer that question by making an example. If you think about um, the Edison lamp, the light bulb, the A1960 watt, which was invented around the time the school was founded, um, that was mandated by our government to be discontinued about 10 years ago. 
And so what that did was that created a lot of focus on something that we've known all of our lives. And if you think about going back in the last 10 years, there was a real push on globe style orb lighting fixtures, chandeliers, and that was emulated from the top of the light bulb. I mean, that's how it came. And there were all kinds of interpretations of that. And so that's an element from the past, or traditional, very traditional, that was being reinterpreted today. Uh, they were made out of wood and iron and, and brass or steel and painted or finished or hand painted or bra whatever. It, it, there were all kinds of orbs. Now take that to the next step and what was a really creative component of that light bulb was the filament. And now you see filament lamps, call them vintage lamps, L, uh, whatever you want to call them, but they're everywhere. They are back. For and, sure. You and, can't find those light bulbs. They're always sold out. And they're, they're not all exactly the A19 60 watt shape. They're in different shapes. But it was, it all started with when something was being taken away from us that we adored. And, um, and that, that element or that uh, vintage lamp, we're translating it in, in uh, industrial designs and with uh, everything is open so that you can see the filament of the lamp whether it's covered by a, a wire mesh or something that you can see right through and see the element that's just it, it's a huge hugely popular and I don't know that you would call it traditional but the element itself is traditional it is. that's a really interesting I like that analogy that's interesting to think about now Wendy I am very familiar with your product now, a lot, a lot of your offering is very traditional, and <laughs> but I feel like you've been slowly infusing some more sort of contemporary designs. We've been trying to mix it up, yeah. <laughs> but our, uh, our clients, our consumers, um, don't let us move very much in one direction or another because when you've developed a signature style, they're looking for that. Um, but one of the things we did recently was did a more modern version of Lou Canton, which everybody's quite familiar with. It's the, it's the cobalt uh, blue that's all over the South and all over actually colonial America. And we put it on a very contemporary shape and we used elements uh, as a repetitive pattern, um, which is getting a good response, especially from younger people. But, um, what I focus on when I'm looking at uh, things to do is whether I get a visceral feeling from it, which is a very strong like for that thing. And then secondly, I look to see if it has a story, because a lot of what we are presenting to people is the history of porcelain and the history of dining and the history of our nation. United States. So fortunately, uh, many of the early pieces were made for kings and rulers, and uh, there weren't very many made. So in the contemporary methods that we have, we can make things for people to see that are actually quite complex, because we have the technical capacity to uh, make those in quantity. And so if you look at Mataheta shapes, they're actually more complex than most things that you find in the marketplace. As the Industrial Revolution has uh, continued on, manufacturers, uh, porcelain manufacturers around the world would like things to be reproducible in large quantity and rather quickly. And so if you make some things in China, you have to order 2,000 at a time. But if you're making things in Europe, uh, with a with a culture or history of uh, production in small quantities, and you know how to make them, you can make quite unusual and beautiful shapes that are what was lovely about that tradition. It's interesting. So we concentrate a lot on shape, a lot on color. I'm sorry, I'm going on. No. <laughs> one more thing: the industry average for colors in. Uh, Tableware is four to eight because that is the easiest thing to do at a good price. We start at four and go up to 27 with our average being 16. So it's the color and actually it's the complexity of shape and also hard porcelain which is slumps in the kiln.
Interesting. Wow. Well, you beautiful product. You all do. Um, you know, you all sort of touched on my next question. Actually, I think you all did. Um, Segwaying into, I was going to reference that the Barcelona chair was something that was designed in 1929. And in a way, all of these lines of tradition are being blurred. What is traditional? Is it a Queen Anne chair? Is it the Barcelona chair? And I guess, um, like I said, we all sort of touched on it that it's not necessarily just an aesthetic now. It's something that's lasting and something that becomes an iconic piece no matter what um, you know, no matter where in time it, fall, it falls or fell. Um, how long do you think something needs to endure before it can be considered a classic? Is there a number or is it just kind of like it just kind of goes on the continuum? I think it goes on as long as it's in people's vocabulary. As long as they're talking about it, using it, enjoying it. I don't think you put a, a time, a number on that. Ten um, years, you're done. No, no, no I, I don't think that's, yeah. that's really Ten possible. Years would be good for a lot of people. But, um, you know, there are so many, I'll speak about textiles, there are so many textiles on the market, over, over assorted, and it's really great when something can stay for 15 or 20 years. I mean, the, the editors love that and the mills really love that. It's really great and it doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's pretty spectacular. You're not wasting resources, samples that you have in your libraries. Um, you know, and if you have something that you love at home and you want to recover it, you can actually get the fabric again, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> so um, something like a, a Sombrella canvas, which is this you know, incredible performance fabric that could look like a cotton or a linen, you, you, it becomes very iconic. And it can be not just outside, but, but inside, and upholstered really beautifully on a very expensive piece of furniture from Ethan Allen or whomever. <laughs> um, it really can. So, so that can be very iconic. I happen to bring this along because oh. it's Sombrella from 15 years ago. It was one of the Dongia designs, and I still see it in magazines, <laughs> usually in combinations of blue, many shades of blue. And I think that's pretty iconic. It's still in, their, in the collection. And, and that says a lot for a textile. Yes, definitely. Um, and then I, I love, also. I love that you have visuals. This is great. <laughs> I do, I have visuals. This, this is called, interestingly enough, the Icon Collection from Sombrella that was introduced a few years ago when we found these incredible stripes in the archives and decided that we wanted to do a collection of multiple stripes and really bright stripes. Um, and this, uh, and I'll pass it around, the actual ad from like 30 years ago is in here with the cabana and the great bathing suit of the period. And so these become iconic, I think, stripes in all the various forms. Um, that's an iconic design that people always love. You love great textures in really great color, neutral textures and colors and, and stripes. Um, so, so I think that um, iconic designs are things, again, that feel, that feel like home, that feel interesting. And I think ECOT falls into that category now as well. It's a classic, the way a stripe is. People understand ECOT. It's, it can be tribal, it can be very refined, it can and be... And it's really so traditional, wasn't it? It's very it? traditional. It, it's, um, was in India, it, didn't it start in India? Um, it, no? it was done simultaneously in Japan, in Indonesia, the whole Silk Road, all of these amazing um, textile, hand, hand loom textile, so where they were actually you know, printing the actual yarns, well, the warp yarns on the loom. So that's becoming uh, iconic. And people talk about and know about these things. I think it's really important that, uh, well, now there's a whole emphasis. I think everyone loves and understands materials more than ever. They're educating themselves. And I just have to put in this little um, PR thing for um, New York Textile Month is happening right now. Some of you, does anyone know about this? It's, it's throughout, uh, it, it's being sponsored by all the different museums and design schools. And there are exhibitions, if you just go online, New York Textile Month. And it's the first one, it was put together by Lee Edelcourt, who's the new dean of, um, 
fusion design, hybrid design, which is so important. I think we're all kind of talking about breaking down barriers and, and fusion of um, old and new and traditional and mid-century modern. We didn't really mention that, but that's a major uh, favorite of the millennials and, and others. They love that. And they look uh, and at that as, like they a, look at that as, as, as a classic. Right. E exactly. So um, I think it's really exciting um, that people are understanding so much more and making textiles also iconic kind of items, not just furniture pieces from architects. Yeah. So anyway, New York Textile Month, and there's exhibitions at museums. There's uh, <coughs> ateliers that are open to the public. Um, it's really, really wonderful, and it's going to be going on for another week or so. Oh, good. Well, look it up online. Now, would anyone else like to address that question? Does anyone else have a really profound answer? <laughs> I, I think um, she touched on something that's really important when you think of iconic pieces and that there is a certain chameleon-esque quality to them and they can start to bridge different style categories. They can work in different types of environments and I, I think when you start to get those designs that if, if you look at it in isolation maybe it's hard to say is it traditional, is it modern? But you start to put it in an environment, you start to put the other things around it, and you build a space, and, and it can work as well in you know, something that's a, a rehab of an urban loft somewhere in Soho, and it works just as nicely in a fabulous home in Connecticut. And I think those pieces that can, can run the gamut are the ones that start to become very iconic and, and can last for a very long time. Yes, please. Um, if, if you guys wait four minutes, we're going to bring a sofa in here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to put some bra on one of your sofas. <laughs> and, sofa and lights are coming down, and you're all getting dishes. Uh, um, you, you know, you, you brought something really interesting up. You brought up the Barcelona chair. I'm going to talk about the Windsor chair. Um, our our best-selling chair is a Windsor chair, and everybody knows what a Windsor chair is. It's a, it's a couple hundred years old, and um, but our best-selling finish is black. So we took a Windsor chair, I think you mentioned it earlier. Um, we, we took a, a very, very classic chair, a very historic chair, a very, very um, recognizable form, and we offered in black. And I just finished a friend's house, and um, I'm not going to talk about years because I just had a birthday, a <laughs> big one. Happy um, birthday. So I, I think it's generational. To, to answer your question, I think, I think it's generational. What's really interesting is, is my, my, my father, who's going to be 89 years, uh, years old next year, wears a jean jacket. Uh, his father, my grandfather, wears a jean, wore a jean jacket, and I wear a jean jacket, and my little nephew wears a jean jacket. So I think it's generational. I think I think a classic or something that's that's traditional is something that is understood and that generations feel comfortable with. Uh, and that same can be with design. Same same could be with 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 furnishings and and how people live. Um, it was really interesting. I just finished um, a friend of mine's home. It's a 70, 1742 uh, federal home, and they're very young and they're very hip. But in their dining room, you know, we painted every drop of wood white. So, so this old historic um, traditional classic is now white, it's gleaming, it's being interpreted as modern. So we went into the dining room and we painted the dining room black. <clears throat> and we took Audubon prints. Does everybody know what Audubon prints are? They're, 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 they're the quintessential antique. Um, and I had to explain to these 30-somethings um, what they are, <laughs> and they 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 that cool. But we mounted them in white linen, and we put white lacquer frames on them, and we put them in groups of 12 on a black wall. And then we took a very quintessential round uh, Ethan Allen table, and we took our black Windsor chairs. So you walk into this very historic, very traditional home that is very comfortable, very warm, very inviting, but it just it reads modern. And modern, I, I always tell my people, like, modern doesn't mean black, black uh, leather and cheap chrome. It means up to date. So all of, this, all, of this, all of this historic, traditional, classic product has been reinterpreted as modern. People come in and they're like, what are these pictures on your walls? And we're like, Audubon prints, OK? They're historic. Come on, get with the program. So, but it looks, it looks, it looks <laughs> incredible. Look so what, you know, once again, it, it's generational. And I think it's getting different, different generations to understand what is a classic yeah. and how you can reinterpret it and this is how I lived with it and this is how grandpa lived with it and this is how grandma lived with it and this is how my nephew lives with it so it's, it's cool it's very yeah. cool and you know I want to take this conversation back to NYSID for a minute because I feel like we have some young designers in the crowd 
And um, we all sort of touched on it. Wendy started the conversation by saying, you kind of do what you know. And so I feel like interior design has changed so much for millennials specifically because, you know, back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, like you just did what your parents did. And that's what their parents did. And that's all you knew because you didn't have the internet and you weren't so educated and so informed. And I feel like the new consumer and the new, um, the younger people are having their, their homes decorated are just, they have so much information coming in. And so I feel like interior designers of today are really sort of like, they're kind of the ultimate magicians where they have to take all of these different things that everybody loves so much and like make it look pretty. Because for an unskilled professional to try that to do that on their own, that's a shame. You should not, they should stay away from doing that. Yeah, no, it's very hard. It's that's hard. why I feel like we interior designers are more important than ever before. Can I say something about yes. that? Yes. Yes, please do. When we're talking about something that is an enduring design, it has certain qualities or attributes. And um, they can be any combination of things. But essentially, you're looking at uh, good design has pleasing proportion, uh, composition that is, uh, that is unified in some way, um, a combination of color and texture, which um, is that thing that you respond to. And often when we're talking about what is good design, um, we recognize it when we see it, but we don't know what it's made up of. And um, I think that no matter what style you have or what age you have uh, to your life, uh, it's possible to address those points. And um, that's something that an interior designer understands and something that an artist understands. And then on top of it, hopefully, people who don't have that experience understand. On that same note, I think you're so right. Um, the golden mean, which is something all students should know about and use, um, that golden proportion, whether you're designing uh, a building or a textile or a plate, is so important. So that's, and, and that <laughs> goes way back. But that, uh, that draws you to something because the proportions are so pleasing. And they're in nature. Right? And they're in nature, they're in our nature. bodies. And so that golden mean is something you all need to study and understand and then put to use. And now I'm going to contradict both of you no. <laughs> By my, with my next question, which is, you know, um, Wendy, you'd mentioned that things are just being reproduced um, at a fast clip, um, you know, with all the production being moved overseas to China. And I feel like now more than ever, people are longing for something that's handmade and has a one-of-a-kind feel. So it might be not completely Greco-Roman, but like, it might be like a little bit wonky and it feels so genuine and authentic. And Rick, I want to talk to you about this because how are you taking, um, I'm sure you have very traditional manufacturing methods. Mm -hmm. Are you finding this need for people who want these one of a kind things? Like how are you working that into your business model and how are you giving that to, to clients? One of the most popular elements in a lot of um, chandeliers or, 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 or featured lighting fixtures in a home is, is iron and hand wrought iron and the roughness of that and uh, uh, the ability that that rough surface provides for hand applied finishes of, of all different colors to match just any, uh, any decor. So, um, you know, starting with the rough surface and then applying a hand applied finish is, is the way that we uh, kind of achieve the handmade and you can experience. almost feel like, you, I feel like you can look at something mm -hmm. that's been touched by a human hand and you just can feel it in mm -hmm. your body. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting, Sherry, I want to ask you because obviously textiles, like hand-woven textiles, would be impossible to, I mean, they take so long to make. How are you, um, how are you providing that, that sort of one-of-a-kind feel to fabrics? Something that is sort of mass made, sort of. Well, Sombrella certainly is mass produced on high power looms, and um, they have very strict performance standards. And visually, everything has to be absolutely perfect. But as we know, the concept of wabi sabi, 
finding beauty and imperfection is infectious. I think people really understand and get it and love it. So one of the first things that Sombrella did a few years ago, which I thought was really brilliant, was to recycle. Well, they've been recycling the, the fabrics, but recycling a fabric to be used. Um, but what happens with the production, it never looks the same because it has all those wonderful little character specks. So like all the shades of uh, rust and red and, and burgundy go in one pot and all the neutrals in another and you can only get a certain uh, kind of pale color. You can't really get pale pale, but they're beautiful. They have character, but for so many people it's a learning curve, especially if you send it to the upholsterer and they see, oh my God, there's a, something here and there's something there and it's not the same and if it's in the middle of the cushion on the sofa, what are you going to do? But I think more and more people are going to be understanding it and they won't be so frightened by it and they, it, you know, it, it's just education. Unless because you're designing for a total Because everybody is wearing clothing. You perfect. <laughs> right, They're, you're wearing boots and handbags that are pre, uh, you know, tumbled and, and they have all kinds of scars and that gives it such beauty. Even leather on furniture, you know, you can get it to look like it's been around forever. Like the 30s deco chairs that people seem to love so much. So I, I think that um, this whole idea of handmade and imperfection is just getting stronger. And I think it's great when you see mass retailers um, putting out one-of-a-kind things, but then they always have more one-of-a-kind things. And there's a buyer just buying incredible pieces that if you like it, you better buy it because it's not going to be <laughs> not there. Something in that same category will be there, but not that piece that you love so much, whether it's a textile or a carved wooden piece. I just think it's great, and, and people love it, and I think it's already been selling very, very well. Oh, and good. Big future yeah. in Laura, all of this. I'm also really curious to hear from you because, again, you sell something that's so sort of durable. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> how, do you, yeah. how do you add that quality, that, that hand-done quality? Well, I think it's, it's actually interesting because for Brizo, all of our textured finishes are hand done. Oh, I didn't so know that. So we have Sorry. these, right. we, we always laugh, we have these incredibly talented people that work in the factory with, you know, forearms the size of my thighs. <laughs> um, but they work on this big brushing wheel and they hand, you know, move the, the product through and they hand buff it. and. Um, and so each piece has a unique texture to it. They have certain directions that they're going to go that, you know, one direction may be more pleasing to the eye, but each one will be a little bit different. And there is a hand craftsmanship that goes into our product that is something you wouldn't expect that there's hand craftsmanship behind. So it's, um, it's pretty fascinating to be down there and to see these people that have the eye and they just pull it back and they look at it and they're like, okay, it needs a little bit more here. And, and it's just working on each individual piece to get it just right before it moves on in the, in the process. So, Interesting. Yeah, more than you would think. Now, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm gonna change up a question just a little bit because I feel like we've kind of gone over this now. So, um, I would like to know, <coughs> um, when you're designing your collections, is there, it, this is more of an of the moment question. Is there a particular sort of aesthetic element that you either are gravitating toward, toward, or that you're shying away from right now, of like of this moment? Are you like, oh, I can't take scrolls. I don't want any arabesques. Like, no, yeah. thank you. Like, is there a particular? Um, I guess kind of I'm asking a trend question of sorts. Oh, you look great. ready. You look ready. <laughs> um, that, that's super important. Um, where we're gravitating toward is livability. Uh, it, it's, it's more people use it in every day. Um, finishes are becoming drier. Fabrics are becoming drier. Um, the glossy, high, high, high sheen uh, products are becoming less and less desirable because they're more they're uh, difficult to take care of. They're harder to take care of. People people are living more simply. They're living more more comfortable, more relaxed. And um, you know you can take relaxed uptown or you can take it downtown. So to answer your question, um, finishes are, are huge. Um, every finish that we have developed has become drier, and the wood has become more important. You know, customers are, are if you know um, are going more and more toward organic. They're going more toward authentic. 
Um, so before before we paint furniture, we we look at the at the at the wood and we say, this is gorgeous. Let's let's call it out, but it's dry. Everything that we've introduced probably in, in the last two years um, has been under the um, the umbrella of livable. Uh, will customers live with this every day? Will they feel comfortable with this? Um, are they going to feel that they can't touch it? So, and that's in every or uh, dust it. Can you imagine yeah. dusting one of those old claw and ball like Maybe. with like a well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a paintbrush? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know, and that's that's characteristic of all the products that we're developing. Even the rugs mm -hmm. are a little bit drier. They're a little bit more weathered. Um, and we also feel um, products that get when they get beat up and they get more used become more desirable. They're, they're less precious and people tend to feel more comfortable with it and they gravitate toward that. Even more of our formal products are getting drier. Uh, the finishes are getting drier and the fabrics are getting drier. Um, and the artwork is getting a little bit drier and more organic. So are there any traditional elements that you're sort of preserving? We, we preserve a lot of traditional elements. A, a lot of the products at Ethan Allen are derived from traditional elements and traditional forms. Um, we're, we, it, it usually, I think you talked about it, we're, we're preserving good design, we're preserving proportion, we're preserving balance, but we're looking at it with a completely different set of eyes. And um, a, a really favorite word of ours is reimagine, and that's a good word that any designer should know. It's like, what could I do with this and reimagine it differently? But most importantly is all of our design, our interior design, our products, um, it's geared to the way people live today, which is a lot more, it's all about comfort. Uh, everyone wants comfort. And everybody, efficiency. Everybody wants efficiency. Everybody wants functionality. Uh, everybody wants style. Um, but at the same time, precious is a bad word. We're, we're, we're talking in our level right now. You know, we don't want it to be too precious. We want it to be beautiful. Uh, we want it to be functional, but at the same time, it's got to be it's got to be livable and relaxed is a favorite word of ours because that's just simply the way people are living today. Wendy, how about your plates? Dishwasher safe? Yay, nay? Really? Wow. Back relief with gold in addition. Because it is about livability. And I mean, Sunbrella is the most like livable. Well, textiles factor. make an environment livable more than any other element because everything else is hard. And you need that textile, whether it's tabletop, great, interesting um, runners, placemats, tablecloth. Um, that it really adds to the seduction of a space. Well, that's, okay. that's one of the. Are we on? <laughs> That's one of the things that um, people shy away from in terms of very elegant or um, high quality porcelain. But when it's made with hard porcelain, which is different than bone china, it actually fires at a higher temperature. And we use um, decal producers who, um, who make very durable things. But the other side of it is, uh, if you're talking about the microwave, there are a lot of technological developments that allow you to use false <laughs> metals so that they actually do go in the microwave. So no more sparks? When you put <laughs> gold in the microwave silver, and you feel like you're about gold. to burn down the house? <laughs> false copper, we use those, uh, as well as we use a lot of gold. But um, you can put those in the dishwasher, That's put amazing. them in the microwave. Now, we are running a little short on time, so this is our lightning round, and I am going to ask, now, if you were speaking to a classroom of NYSED students, what advice, very briefly, would you give them in terms of understanding the relevance of traditional designs today? Take it away. Okay. <laughs> I think it's really important to um, do some study, and, and you have fabulous courses here, on the history of design, the history of decorative arts. It's so important, you know, they always tell you, you can break the rules, but first you have to know what they are and what came before. I think that's really important. The other thing when, that has to do with fabric, you always have to see a big piece of fabric. Don't ever make a decision for yourself or a client looking at something that this this big. You need to learn to touch and feel and drape and stretch, throw it over a piece, put it up to the window. It's so important to engage and learn as much as you can about materials. They are the most underestimated uh, tool in your design toolbox, really. And um, that will make the space human, but you need to learn and be an expert on what materials to use for upholstery, what are better for windows, um, it, it's just an incredible world and 
materials include hard materials as well and different finishes, but learn as much as you can. And because so many people that come out of, um, well, a lot of the architects are not really um, vo uh, you know, versed in, in textiles. They think it's just decoration and fluff and, and not so important as what they do. And, and that's what we said. You on are the day. ones that are going to make it livable <laughs> and, and functional and exciting, and, and you're going to do a lot of business doing that as well. So um, that's my advice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good advice. So again, if you were giving um, advice to NYSED students, a classroom of NYSED students, about understanding the relevance of traditional, de traditional designs. Um, Go. Okay, uh, they're really fast. I can talk fast. Um, traditional design isn't going anywhere. Uh, there, my, um, it's, it's really important that we maintain traditional traditions, particularly as the world gets more and more complicated. People want to be comfortable. They want to feel safe. Um, it's, it's okay to take the old and mix it with the new. It's all about positioning, how you're going to project it. Um, take, mix the materials, take, take a little bit of the past, mix it with the future. But what's, what's really, really important is um, you got to know how people live today, and you got to really, really listen to how they live their lives on a daily basis and take your design and take your style and apply it that way. So it's old meets new, juxtapositioning, it's wonderful. Mix it up. Great. Laura? Yeah, I, you took my juxtaposition. Sorry. It's a good uh, word. It's a, good, it's a really good it's, word. It's a good word. We've it's, had a lot of good um, words tonight. <laughs> Wabi Sabi. I'm it's, looking that up yeah. after this. Seduction is a good word. Yeah. You want, you want, you want Lots to of good sound you bites to, yeah. tonight. You want to seduce your client. Yeah. I, I think you would always say, if you look over the history of design, you always see this interesting pendulum swing, you know, between things that feel a little bit more hearkening to the past and and classical in nature, and, and you'll start to see, you know, decoration will go a little bit more ornate, or, or you start to see more decorative elements, and then you see the pendulum swing, and it goes to the more modern end of the spectrum where everything gets cleaned up. And so I think as a practicing designer, you need to understand how that pendulum swings and how it changes each time it goes back and forth. And the studying, just to understand the past, understand what those rules are and when it's okay to break them. And then my own little pitch from the plumbing world, really take the time to understand plumbing because your plumbing contractors will lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of things you really can do in the bath, even though it takes them two extra hours. Yeah. So. <laughs> Been there. Been there. Rick, so advice. Advice from, to students. From a lighting standpoint, I think um, Tradition is going to be based in the shapes of a chandelier or in the shapes of a, a wall lantern. That's going to define it as traditional, but it'll be interpreted with elements or materials that are much more updated. So think of um, uh, your grandmother's crystal chandelier. It had glass arms and big pendulogs and so on, and it's something that really is not very popular today. But you can do, I, I described earlier, an iron chandelier that, that we have several of. And they have crystal balls or some element of crystal, not a lot, but that would be today's crystal chandelier. So that's like taking a little bit from the past and interpreting it today. And knowing those elements and what, where the tradition comes from, knowing about the different types of glass and, um, or fabric, if it's a fabric shade and a more, more of a pendant kind of a thing. I think the, the importance is learn about the elements and the history of those elements. Talk about hard to clean, those all crystal chandeliers. <laughs> I'm getting nervous just thinking about it. Yeah. From Wendy, advice that you would give the students. Strive for excellence in everything you do, and all the products that you make uh, don't skim. Because um, people respond to that. And even though it's expensive, there will always be people coming back to you because they understand the difference. Secondly, I would say that if you are curious about all cultures, curious about all time periods, you're going to find something in everything that you look at that will be inspirational. And it may not be something that you understand, but uh, you will gain in your skill. And the third thing is concentrate on skills. You know, a lot of people have a lot of great ideas, but they're not actually very good at executing them. So that somebody who has a broad number of skills down to the smallest thing, like stitching a fabric or learning how something is painted in porcelain or how plumbing works, those skills are what are going to make you 
Excellent. Well said. Well, I think we are panelists who are so passionate about design and so knowledgeable deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. So I would love to open it up to the audience. If you guys have any questions, we'd love to take some questions if you're up for it. Anyone? I have some photographs, some pictures and things. If anyone wants to see, I'm just going to put them out here <laughs> that are really kind of interesting. Sherry uh, has a whole display yeah, ready I do, to go. I do. And we're having a sofa shift. There was a question over there. There was a question over there. Oh, there's a question? Yes. Come on. Hi. My name is Tomas. I'm with Gambia. Love you, Sherry. <laughs> so my question is about the global market. What the traditional here is not compared to the traditional regulations. How do your respective firms uh, address that? For example, I go back to Argentina and visit my relatives and my friends and they think I am crazy for wearing man red pants. <laughs> well, she might be. It's something that's very crappy and very traditional. So what's, what's traditional here is really very sort of wild. Good question. Um, uh, I'm not a panelist. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, it, it's hard. It's very difficult because we have showrooms in Paducah, Kentucky, and Dubai. Uh, what you have to do is you have to you, you alter. You take your brand, you keep the essence of it, you keep the core of it, but once again, it's how you project it and how you interpret it. So we have a lot of the same products because you know we, we, we're a global brand, and we don't want to change up our DNA. We don't want to change our message, but at the same time, what, does, what sells in Paducah, Kentucky, isn't going to sell in Dubai. So you take it and you alter it. And it's all about projection. You take the same core product and you just project it differently uh, according to where, you know, and we're all over. We're in Saudi Arabia. We're in California. Uh, so it's a problem that we deal with daily. And it's conversations that we're still having within our, with our organization. And um, it, it's, it's hard. So you just, you just project it. You keep the essence. You keep the message. You keep the feeling. You keep the vibe. And you just project it differently. Really? Yes, kind of, oh. A number of years ago, um, we were having these uh, design meetings at Vista Alegre in Portugal, where they would invite people, um, distributors from different countries, all the different countries that sold their product. And they, we, they gave us a little pad of paper and a pencil, and we went around to all the things in the room. Some of them were on paper, and some of them were actually in ceramic form and they asked us to rate them, you know. And the first two years, everybody said, oh, this is what sells in my country. And that person said, this is what sells in, that, in, in my country. And after about three years of doing this, actually what sold were the same products in all countries. Yes, I agree 100%. So on even though it's possible to modify something so that it will be more understandable, let's say in the colorway or something like that, the things that are good products actually are fairly universal. I, I think that's totally true. And I think the, the higher level, um, the more it's true. The world is really small. People see things. They're very educated. They travel. And, and they, they are influenced by the same museum shows and the same fashion and the same music. And, and the fusion of all of these things is really um, affecting everyone subliminally as well as you know, things that you know are affecting you. So I think it's very exciting that there is this sort of global um, trend where, where people are on the same wavelength Tell most of the time. You might want to consider retiring your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I love them. They're so classic American. Well, I think what's interesting that you had mentioned, we, had, um, we have a number of designs that are more in the Art Nouveau type of design genre. And we've always referred to those as more traditional designs here in the US. And then when we got out into global markets, we had the reaction, they're like, oh my gosh, those are so out there. They're so different. You know, these are so modern. So for us, we're like, okay, just stick on the modern end of the spectrum. And <laughs> done. <laughs> because it is, they just come at it from a different view. And again, it gets back to that, what does modern mean? What does traditional mean? And great design doesn't necessarily have to be bucketed into one of those. Redefining traditional. There's a question in the back. Do you find in general that there is a difference between classic and traditional? Good question. Hmm. Traditional can be bad, <laughs> it can be good, 
And classic is always good, in my opinion. Can you give an example of bad traditional? I'm curious, for my own self. <laughs> <laughs> Furniture that's in the wrong proportion? That's we not, were, We right? were doing a job in a very, uh, very huge and beautiful wood building, uh, and the furniture was kind of like, it was, it was Chippendale, but not really <laughs> good, good Chippendale, so that it had a lot of curves, and you had to, when you sat down, you were almost at the lounge level, you know? When you're sitting in a chair and you're doing things for, let's say, somebody, um, in a more formal setting, they have to be able to perch. There is a height of a chair that makes it worthwhile because you can get up and down very easily, whereas that furniture might have been great in some small home, but it was completely inappropriate for that spot, and they had had it for years. And so that's what I mean by bad tradition. I like that. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> Now? Such good questions. I want to know the I'm answers. the queen of discontinued, so I have a very hard time <laughs> answering <laughs> We We actually um, uh, feel the, the, the need for more traditional product, and we archived our old designs, or, and, and we went through those archives. And we pulled from those, we updated in some ways, and we called it our heritage collection. And that's been introduced now for about three or four years, and we're going to continue to add to that. So it's, it's really, a, a, in reality, pulling from the old and, and making new interpretations of the old. And I, I, would, I would almost say that those, because of the timeliness, I think of classic more in a timeliness, a timeless, excuse me, timeless, kind of a thing rather than traditional. So there could be designs that aren't traditional, but they could still be classics because they've been a go-to forever. So that, that's the way I, I separate the two. Any other final question? Beth? I was just going to ask when you were talking about how handcrafted and, and hand application is so prized today, especially, I think, with younger generations. Do any of you, as you incorporate that into your collections, find it difficult to find artisans who can do that handwork? Oh, and do, yeah. you, um, do any of your companies have programs where there's sort of an apprentice-like situation where you're encouraging younger generations to learn those handcrafts? Um, you know, I can speak to artists using materials that are industrial. And most artists and designers only really love natural fibers. But a textile artist like Sheila Hicks has been doing uh, wonderful installations. This was in the Palais du Tokyo in Paris. And that's all sombrella fiber and yarn. And it's, it's kind of amazing to get an artisan that's an artist sorry, that is very turned on by an industrial fabric because it's in a public space, so you don't want it to mildew, you don't want it to fade, and anytime it's a fiber or a fabric or a yarn, people want to touch it, so it's, it's not going to be destroyed. And, and this is another example that I brought that I think is <laughs> amazing. This is, passion is amazing. This is a totem pole done by Japanese designer. Her name is Yagi. I'm going to pass these around. And it's all sombrella, yarn dyed stripes. It's been for four years at Jack Larson's Longhouse. And it's all sombrella stripes. And she engineered this in an amazing way. Uh, it's part of this uh, peace project that she does around the world. And she's using, again, an industrial fabric to hand make this. But it's, it's artistry and it's industry together, which is so important and so, but you know, everyone who's doing anything really relevant today are marrying those two things, the hand and the industry. And that makes for the most interesting um, pieces that have real soul and speak to you know the 21st century, which is what I think we all need to be thinking about, not just how things were done. I mean, incorporating the best of the past 
into something very new in the future, but it's all recognizable so it doesn't feel alien. It feels like something you want to be around. Does anyone else want to speak to that? Well, I just, I mean, you hit on a real sore spot because yeah. there is a big void. No, I, yeah. no I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I it, there's a huge void in this country, but it's even starting elsewhere we, where we create product. I mean, those are, there are some jobs that just uh, are hard to get people to fill them. It's not because of skill so much. It's just they don't want to do it. People have to be in a culture of... Uh, where one generation is teaching the next generation and there's a willingness to do it. And as we're becoming uh, what I, you know, that um, movie, um, um, Never, what, what was it? The Big Nothing was coming, which meant that people were losing their traditions, you might say, or losing their capacity to do these crafts because the younger generation was not interested in it, and it's something that one person teaches to another with care. The places that porcelain is the best in the world are places where they have several generations of working on it, so they still have that capacity. And the other thing is that anything that we make into a design, we paint it entirely first, and then we separate it into um, different um, colors, like you do in a textile, only everything starts out being hand painted and then the choices are made from there. Mm -hmm. So that is a that is a an artistic process that goes on today. But we do have a problem in that not enough people are learning those special skills. Well, again, uh, thank you all so much for coming. You are an amazing audience, but really, let's give it again for the stellar panel. Thank you all so much. I just want to say thank you um, to NYSID for having us. Um, you have a really great program, and we're so happy to be a part of it. Thank you all. Have a good thank night. Thank you.